Okay, it's, uh, it's time. We have a, a quorum um, and I'd like to welcome everybody that's uh, coming to this session. Um, I'm Libby Hepburn and my co-host for this workshop is Ingrid Garland. And uh, this is Ingrid. And first of all, I'd like to, to pay respects to um, the traditional custodians of the land, to elders past, present and emerging, and all ind indigenous people. Always was and always will be. And we welcome any, anybody of indigenous descent who's here with us today. Um, this workshop today is, um, it's, it started really because it's been now several years since we talked to, since I talked about water um, with Ingrid. She did a presentation at one of the AXA AGMs, I think a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as I'm concerned, water is one of the, the Water is one of the most important things that we have for citizen science because it, it, uh, it hits the sweet spot as far as um, people's interest and the importance of, of, of science itself. So what we, I work at a global scale with citizen science and what we look for is where can citizen science make a difference on a local and global scale? And we find out again and again, it's where and when it's important to the people themselves. And water is so many things to so many people and it's always important and it always will be. So lots and lots of citizen science projects are there and have been there for a number of years. Um, and one of the questions that we had a few years ago was, well, why isn't more of the data that's collected being used in reporting and management? So that's what's brought us to this workshop um, to have a look at what the situation is today and to perhaps see the, where we might go in the future, because a lot of things have changed in the last few years. And uh, we think it's probably a very good time to take a good look at uh, what's happening, particularly in terms of data and, and data management uh, that might make a difference for the future. So today um, we're going to have a presentation just of a few ideas of international um, water, community water monitoring, but very importantly, uh, several examples from Australia. Um, and then we've got um, a couple of people who are very used to working with uh, data from CSIRO to talk to us about some new ideas. And then we're going to have a, a workshop um, with a few questions to talk about to see what the general understanding is about data um, and water monitoring by the community and its value and how to make it more valuable. And if, if at the end of all that, it appears that, that now is a good time to perhaps start a community of practice around this to see if we can help to advance it together, then, then that's what we'll do. So I would like to just to offer you a few thoughts. Um, one of the people that I'm working with on the global situation is a, a lady called Mariana Varese. And um, if you, we think we've got challenges here, well, how about this one then? Where they got uh, in the Amazon basin, they have 5,500 kilometers from um, where the, the rivers originate down to, to the, the end. So it's an amazing landscape that they're trying to monitor. And what's happening there is that they're, they're working with the indigenous fishermen, all sorts of different in, indigenous fishermen in the Amazon. Uh, and they've got together and over the last 20 years, they've um, worked with over a hundred plus citizen science groups to monitor the water quality and also the fish migrations. 
it's an amazing project and tonight we've got Mariana who's going to be describing this in more detail so if you can join the international inspiration session this evening you'll be able to learn a lot more about it um, but for the time being, it's just a thought that um, water monitoring can be done on a small scale, but it can also be done effectively um, and in a very complex way um, in, on a very large scale as well. So I'd like to introduce you to someone who can talk about the history of water quality monitoring in this country. Um, Ingrid has been a long-time friend and I'm very glad she's with us today um, and she's been in community education for a, a long time now and in 2016 she set up her own company. So I'd like to hand over to Ingrid for you to talk us through the, uh, the history of water quality monitoring here. Uh, Shall I just pay, play your presentation? Yeah, that'd be great if you could. Thank you very much, Libby. Okay. We weren't quite sure whether Ingrid was going to be with us because she's um, imminently about to uh, give birth, but we're lucky she is with us today, but she did this just Hi in there. case. I'm just going to give you a really quick rundown on Water Watch's history in Australia. And um, it all began back in the early 90s um, on the Sydney's Northern Beaches uh, with a uh, group of teachers and scientists and environmental uh, government experts that were looking at a water quality health issue uh, in the Narrabeen Lagoon and Lakes. Um, and from out of that was born Streamwatch, which uh, very quickly um, developed into a program that was taken on in other areas of like the Hunter and Central Coast in New South Wales, and then spread nationally. Um, in the early 2000s, it was rebadged outside of Sydney as Waterwatch. Um, and so it's been operating for 28 years now, and which is very lucky that it's been a program around for so long. And its vision is about empowering and engaging communities across Australia to care for catchments. So through citizen science, providing high quality data, raising awareness for and the capacity of people to do local action. So, um, as I said, it's a citizen science program based on water quality. That could be water quality testing and it also has included water bugs as well. Um, it can be used as an engagement and capacity building tool, but also a citizen science component where we're, you know, training up for data collection. It reaches a really wide target audience. It can be adapted to a range of topics, which makes it nice and flexible. Um, and again, about collecting nice quality data that gives us some waterway condition information. Um, we have water watch kits that have kind of been developed and tried and tested over the years to have good equipment in it that is not only accurate, but in educational. So we have uh, parameters that are measured are temperature, pH, conductivity and turbidity, which is called our basic set. Then we can scale up to do senior range, which adds in available phosphate and dissolved oxygen. And some other regions and states might add in other things like nitrates for coliforms or E. coli, depending on what questions they're trying to answer in terms of their water quality and aquatic health. Um, we can work in both freshwater and estuarine areas. Um, and over the years, we've partnered up a lot with um, other projects like the National Water Bug Blitz, which has been happening for the last few years about uh, water bugs across Australia, um, working with freshwater turtle projects, particularly um, more recently with Bellingen River Watch, um, the Manning Turtle Project, and now the One Million Turtle Project, which is coming online as well. Um, in Victoria, ACT and some other areas are starting to do more and more with platypus eDNA projects. Um, and, and collection of samples along with the water quality monitoring and also use of our water quality data in catchment health reporting, so the environment, that sort of thing. So how have we managed to stick around for so long? Really, um, I think there would be uh, probably a lot of discussion around change. There's, we've had to be adapted to change. We've had to innovate, collaborate with lots of organisations and together support each other, but mostly because this program is championed by a group of really passionate people that really care about the program 
and want to work with scientists, agencies, communities and to see our waterways, I guess, flourish and do a lot better. Um, here's some of those people. We have a Water Watch Australia network. So there's been no national coordination of Water Watch since 2007. Um, back in the early 2000s, there was actually a few staff and a national coordinator in Canberra that were helping to coordinate the program and have conferences. But um, that lost funding back then. So uh, a group of us just get together four times a year to chat about how we're going with our own programs. Um, have we got any funding issues? Um, what special projects we're working on? Data equipment, QA, QC. Uh, and really just kind of to talk through where we're at with our program and uh, how we can support each other. If anyone wants to come and join us, uh, please let me know. More than merrier. Um, we also, the best thing about Water Watch is that we have standardised equipment and procedures. So we're always looking to improve those, um, looking at what else uh, is beneficial for the volunteers to use. Sorry, so I'm not speaking. A range of okay. I was just like playing this, so I thought. Yeah. I thought, yeah, I thought you were, sorry. That's okay. or equipment issues. So that's done on an annual basis in a couple of areas. Um, and also Victoria uses something which is data confidence level. So that's looking at people's training frequency and testing and their experience and giving them a basically rating on how accurate their data would be. Uh, and for data management, we have Victoria have a database developed with Federation Union Ballarat, which is online and anyone can access their data. It's all verified by coordinators. And that's the same for New South Wales and ACT up in Murrumbidgee. They've, we've got our um, database developed on the BioCollect Atlas of Living Australia platform. So you can also jump on there and export data. Most of the other programs around the country have their own in-house database or they might have an uh, Excel spreadsheet, but everyone's always looking to do our data better and we're always happy to share it. So thanks very much. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Ingrid. That, that was great. It um, that gives us a nice roundup of, of what's happening in, um, in Water Watch itself. And now I hope you're going to introduce uh, some of your colleagues to tell us um, specifically about their projects. So who would you like to... Yeah. Um, all right, so I guess the part of the reason that we're here to have a chat today in our workshop is around data and being able to utilise the data and, um, and having it more accessible, having people see that it's um, or users of the data, that it's quality, that it's robust, that we've got great QAQC procedures, all that sort of stuff in terms of citizen science, water quality data, however that's collected across programs. So what we thought um, would just to pick a couple of great examples within, um, uh, I guess, Australia of what's working really well at the moment and people that have made some really great progress. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Wu O'Reilly, who's the ACT Upper Murrumbidgee Water Watch Facilitator. So, um, and then after that, we've got an example from South Australia about adapting to change, which is Sylvia Clark. And after that will be Amy Denchai, who's the program coordinator for Bellingen River Watch on the north coast of New South Wales. Um, and then we have a quick video from Freshwater Watch from Izzy uh, Bishop, who is from the Europe uh, Earth Watch section. So um, we've got um, those presentations coming up. Um, and if you have any questions, please just pop them in the chat. Um, and if we can't get back to any today, uh, we'll follow those up with everyone later. So if Libby, you could play. Uh, I don't have Ruth. She will have to share a screen with Ruth. All right. Where were you there? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. I just tried to share my screen. It's saying host tabled. Um, so I, <clears throat> I did. I my talk is on the uh, Google Drive. 
Google Drive. Do you want um, me to open it? Lisa? I was going to share it, but it's not letting me. Sorry, Lisa, you might have to make make uh, Wu a admin to be able to do this, a co-host. Where is she? Uh, just got to find her first. Um, Somewhere here. Yeah, Lib Libby will have to do that. Yeah, I'm, got, I'm trying to find her. She's just below Michelle in the list. <laughs> While you're doing that, um, Ingrid, would you like to answer a question to fill in some time? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm oh, focusing the question in the chat from um, Janet. Yeah, from Janet. So mm -hmm. what instruments are supplied in the Water Watch kit? So we've got um, a thermometer, a pH strips or a meter, uh, EC meters, which can be single, uh, like low or high or dual range, a turbidity tube. Then for generally for the standard kits, we're using colorimeters for available phosphate, um, and, which are the Lamotte ones. And then for dissolved oxygen, we can use a colorimeter, the Lomot colorimeter smart two or three, whichever one we're up to. Um, and then, oh, but most groups, which is usually driven by price, is using the Winkler titration method. So they're the bits of um, equipment that get used. Um, and I will go and find the questions and answer the rest after. <laughs> but I'll leave it with Wu now. Thanks, Wu. Thanks, Wu. Um, not sure if you, if, is everyone hear me okay? Because I'm, I'm getting, yes, um, we can hear you and Ingrid see your was, slides. Uh, it's all good. And see the screen? Yep. Excellent. Okay. It's good to, thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, yeah, everyone, um, my name's Wu O'Reilly. I, uh, facilitate the Upper Murray Water Watch Program in the ACT region. Um, and I'm just speaking to you today from Nungawal country. And we also, um, uh, work on Narago country to the south as well. Uh, we work in the, uh, a catchment scale. We're not just working on the ACT region. You can see the ACT in the middle of this map, um, but we are working in the whole upper Murrumbidgee. So from the top of the, the headwaters of the Murrumbidgee up in Kosciuszko all the way down to Burrinjuk Dam near Yass, an area of around about 11,000 square kilometers. Um, we have coordinators that sit out in catchment groups um, working directly with the volunteers. Um, and up until last week, we also had a citizen science data analyst who I haven't forgiven for leaving us yet, who uh, looks at our data as well and adds lots of value, Rod, who I think is there today. Um, so that's our team. Uh, so we, you know about Waterwatch from Ingrid. Um, in 2012, uh, Waterwatch in the Upper Murrumbidgee was facing a bunch of issues regarding its data due to the fact that um, lots of different uh, funding sources and the fact that the the different catchment groups were managing the programs somewhat separately, it meant we had different uh, standardized processes. We didn't have standardized processes and methods. Not all our data was publicly available. Some was in databases um, within the, um, groups and others weren't. Uh, reporting either catchment scale, the upper Murray Ridge scale was, was done very coarsely and not in a particularly useful way and thus no one was using it. Um, there was increased pressure from funders to actually see evidence of data uptake, which um, frankly it found hard to come by. We didn't actually have a lot of examples of people using the data. And as you would know that or relate to, we had lots of issues with people's attitudes towards citizen science data and a lack of confidence in it. Um, so consequently in 2013, 14, we call the year in the wilderness, we actually lost our funding from the, from the federal government. Um, we conducted a review in that time to look at increasing confidence in data uptake for Waterwatch data uh, by researchers and policymakers in order to help secure some future funding. Uh, so as part of that, we did a bunch of data reforms. Um, we standardized our kits and our manuals and our training across all the, all the subcatchments. We uh, refined our QAQC workshop processes so that there was a faster feedback loop for our volunteers. We did troubleshooting on the spot with them at workshops and Rod and um, would look at all the data after the workshops and, and uh, feedback to the, the um, volunteers where the issues were, were in terms of our data, data um, methods, uh, which was really helpful. Um, we looked at better partitioning between citizen science and community engagement and education, which are the other aspects of the Water Watch program. And I'm happy to go into more detail on that um, in our breakout um, sessions later. And as uh, Ingrid said, we also now have all our data publicly available in one database on the Atlas of Living Australia. 
another cru crucial thing that we did was we looked at, um, we got the University of Canberra to do a data review where they compared our data to other forms of professionally collected data. Um, and uh, so they found weaknesses, uh, pH that we could work on. They found that our coverage and our continuity was very important, that sites greater than three years of age with continuous data were very, extremely valuable. Um, they recommended we put more sites into our, our upper catchments to get more reference sites to get a broader picture of catchment health. Um, and they also um, advised us on changes to the CHIP report, which we um, is pretty much the, uh, I suppose, showpiece of, of the program. That's a report that we, we produce every um, year on World Water Day in March. Um, it can, it's uh, individual report cards uh, broken up into reaches on, on every uh, system through the Upper Murrumbidgee catchment. Uh, this one is an uh, example of the of the Nace River, where you can see uh, it, that that one's yellow for fair. Um, the top of the Nace is is, is green for good, and that's uh, in the conservation areas, whereas the lower half is in rural areas. So these reaches get broken up into into land uses, and um, we also combine the water quality data that the volunteers collect with water bug data that is predominantly collected by staff with the help of volunteers and, and it, that's collected every every uh, six months as well as riparian assessments which are done every two years at every site. Um, each, each report card has the, the uh, summary of the data for the year, the map, um, but also very importantly it has a interpretation that's written by the coordinators who know the sites best, who are uh, right up about how the site's doing that year and, and it, it also gives you a general overview of land use and um, and issues regarding that, that area. So you can take that site, you can look at them, you can take a journey down the river if you like, you can look at individual reaches, but you can also get a, a, an overview of, of the whole catchment kind of summarised into uh, what were 98 report cards within that report last year, so that you can get a good high level snapshot of the of the um, of the catchment, as well as going into detail for land managers. So it's aimed at being a good communication tool, as well as good for land managers. So summarised from last year, there's 229 sites were in there, nearly 2,000 water quality surveys, and nearly 200 um, water bug and and riparian surveys that went into those 98 report cards. Uh, so it's really translated to really excellent data uptake in, in the uh, upper Murrumbidgee area. We uh, have got some really great examples of environmental grants, Icon Water, our water utility uses our data. Um, and there's at least three government monitoring programs that are using our data uh, quite importantly now. Um, that illustration there is from the State of Environment report for the ACT in 2019, which as you can see had our CHIP report and our water quality data right at the centre of, of reporting on water quality in the region. So um, we've got a real great level of acceptance now and thankfully we've also got great secured um, funding. Um, we've got ongoing funding there now. So um, yeah, um, it's been a really great journey and we, um, we are looking at expanding water quality now and we're doing, as I say, platypus turtles uh, and frog watch as well are all part of that water watch banner. So, you know, that's, um, that's, that's it for me. Thanks very much, Wu. Much appreciated. Thank you. And well done. You stuck to time too. <laughs> um, Did I? I was, yeah. I was racing. <laughs> Good job. I know. So uh, apologies to everyone. These presentations are pretty quick, but we wanted to jam in as much as we could. So um, Sylvia, you're up next. So from um, Water Watch in South Australia. That looks about right. I hope at your end. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm the Senior Project Officer for Citizen Science with the Murray Lands and Riverland Landscape Board and so I've been looking after the Water Watch program here for the last six years or so in amongst a whole lot of other programs that we've been running as well. So in South Australia, Water Watch started in the 1990s and into the 2000s with that national rollout that Ingrid mentioned. Uh, people measured water quality parameters and also collected macroinvertebrates water bugs and identified them to order. And at the beginning, there were a range of coordinators across the state that helped to train people and provide them with the equipment they needed. Unfortunately, after a while, all that funding stopped in South Australia and most of the regions stopped running Water Watch. The SA Murray-Darling Basin region did, however, keep it going, what is very important in our region. 
And we did that by gathering whatever sources of funding we could, but uh, the resources were, were dwindling over time. So I came on in about 2015, and at that stage, we were compiling all that data. There was a couple of decades of data at that point, compiling it into some quite technical catchment reports. And I very proudly went and presented them to government departments involved in catchment management and presented it to the community that had been collecting the data. And I got back crickets. There was no response <laughs> from anybody. <laughs> so uh, that kind of made us evaluate the program. I go, hang on a minute here. Uh, do we need to stop this like everyone else did at the state? Um, there seem to be a lot of problems with trust of the data in terms of for government um, use. Uh, they weren't convinced with our verification steps. There was quite a high cost with running this and obviously communication of our results to the community wasn't hitting the mark either. But it, we decided it was worth continuing. There was a whole lot of engagement in the state these people were out there happily collecting this data and caring about these catchments. So we couldn't, I couldn't stop it. And I was like, I'm pretty sure there's a need for this data. And when we investigated a bit more, there really was a need for this data. This is the driest state on the driest continent. We're at the tail end of the Murray-Darling Basin. People are affected socially, emotionally, and economically by water quality and water availability. And people care. So we had to look at how we could actually get this back on track. There was a need for data on catchment health, the impacts of our water policies, impacts of on-ground intervention. We have some programs, particularly in the Eastern Mount Lofty Ranges, where we're trying to, we're putting low flow devices on dams to allow those early flows back into the systems. You know, what impacts are they actually having? And then there's site and catchment level impacts of pollution development and also the riparian restoration efforts. Are they actually improving the health? There was really not a lot of data out there for any of these things. So surely Water Watch, could play a part helping out here. So we worked with the scientists, the catchment managers, scientists and the community to work out how we could get this back on track. So it was providing useful fit for purpose data. So we reduced the number of water quality parameters we were collecting. We had been doing nitrates and phosphates and DO, dissolved oxygen, but we took that right back to that minimum set that Ingrid mentioned. It was just the EC, turbidity, pH. And these were really useful parameters to be measuring that the catchment managers wanted. Uh, that was also cheaper to do fewer than we didn't have to provide these as many expensive kits. Um, and they were reasonably reliable measures as well. We brought flow in for particularly in these ephemeral streams, whether there's water there or not is just as important, if not more important than the quality of the water. So we introduced things like gauge boards um, and just and photo points as well to give us a, an indication of the actual whether water's there or not. In terms of water bugs, macroinvertebrates, the uh, government scientists just wouldn't trust any of the water bug data that the community were collecting on their own, no matter how trained they'd been. Uh, and also it was the fact that at order level, there was a lot of information being missed as well. So what we do now is we run water bug bio blitzes where we have the community come together with the professionals and we collect samples across a catchment on a single day. And the experts are there on site to make sure the methods are done properly, the samples are sorted properly and identifications are done appropriately as well. And this now also aligns with the EPA's catchment monitoring uh, methods as well. So there have been a lot of changes and it's been quite a process getting to this point. But indicators are that WaterWatch SA is on the rise again. We now have a couple of other regions joining us and replicating our methods. We make sure that our data is shared widely and people are aware of it. Uh, particularly the water bug data now goes into state and national databases and is shared with the National Water Bug Blitz database as well. And we're really hoping to share our water quality data further as well. We produce technical and more community friendly report cards now. And we make sure that we connect with all the other players in the water management space. So Department of Environment and Water, landscape boards, environmental NGOs, local government, Aboriginal waterway assessments. And all of these partners are invited to our water bug bi blitzes as well. So as well as a data collection exercise, they're also a communication and collaboration exercise as well. We all share, share and learn and listen to each other's perspectives. If we want water policy to be effective, we need everybody on board. 
Improving data availability and water literacy among the population of the dry state in Australia is going to become even more critical into the future. And things are going to continue to change. But I think Water Watch SA is getting set to play a key role in this space. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Really appreciate your time. And um, another good story of evolution, adaptation, and just keeping on pushing with the, with the community. Um, the next uh, person we've invited to speak um, is Amy Denshire. Um, she's got a pre-recorded session. Um, Belling and Riverwatch began um, uh, a little while ago. I'll let Amy tell the story, but in terms of response to a major uh, threatened species um, issue, which Sue Lennox from Ozgreen, who's online and also one of the original instigators of Streamwatch, uh, made a few phone calls and got this awesome project underway. So um, I'll let Amy's presentation speak for itself. They're doing some data communication really, really well at the moment. Just see if we can find some sound. Hello, Libby. If you're trying to share some sound, you might need to unmute. This week period. There we go. Prior to this event, the population for the species Sorry. is historically between 3,000 and 6,000 animals. Thanks, Libby. I'm sorry, Hi, I didn't... I'm Amy. I'm the Bellingen Riverwatch coordinator with Ausgreen. Bellingen Riverwatch began following a turtle mortality event in 2015. The project is based in Bellingen, a small town on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. In early 2015, the Bellinger River snapping turtle suffered a significant mortality event, where an estimated 90% of the population is believed to have died within as a result of, a, of the, a virus, the Bellinger River virus, in an approximate six week period. Prior to this event, the population for the species is historically between 3,000 and 6,000 animals. The current Bellinger River snapping turtle population is estimated to be less than 200 individuals and predominantly juveniles. A need to collect continuous scientifically robust data Water quality data has been, was identified as a priority need by the scientists involved in the recovery of the turtle to help inform management decisions. The turtle is now listed as critically endangered. And The turtle is now listed as critically endangered and it's endemic to the Bellinger River. A total of 35 healthy turtles were removed from the river by the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and are now part of a captive breeding program, two captive breeding programs, sorry, at, one at Taronga Zoo, Sydney, and one at Symbio Wildlife Park. There have now been multiple successful releases of captively bred turtles. The data that we collect through Bellingen River Watch is available for use by our partners to inform management decisions towards the survival of this species. The community is deeply engaged in the program and Bellingen River Watch has grown over the last four years and now tests at 30 sites across the Bellinger and Killeen catchments. We have 17 partners on our steering committee who help guide the direction of the program. There's 45 volunteers and five schools. We test for water quality monthly and thanks to the Commonwealth Australian Government's bushfire recovery program for wildlife and their habitat, 
and the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and its Saving Our Species program. We've embarked on a biannual macro invertebrate monitoring program. However, the macro program is very new, so I'm going to be focusing on the water quality monitoring program in this presentation. Bellingen Rewatch is one of the largest water quality monitoring programs in New South Wales. Our volunteers test for seven parameters as shown. We use the following equipment supplied by Vendart Diagnostics. We use the Winkler titration method for our dissolved oxygen test. Once the volunteers have collected their data, they upload their data to the WaterWatch portal. Our scientist partners then export the data and verify it. Quarterly, we send the data to the seed portal. There's many different audiences that we consider um, when we've designed our data communications. Basically, we were looking to create a solution that served both the community and river stakeholders. We wanted to create simple, easy to read prose, easy to quote statistics, plain English communications that were accessible for everyone in the community and were quick and easy for government staff to use to guide their decision. This is the data interpretation key that we're using. This has been developed by the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment Science Division. You can find this uh, table at the URL shown. So what I do is I take the verified data and using a Google spreadsheet um, with inbuilt calculations and conditional highlighting, it basically automatically creates a coloured table of the results for each month. And then I post that onto uh, what we created which is a data portal, which is basically a Google site that we've created just for our data. You can find this data portal at the URL shown. Uh, so we, we upload our data monthly here in those coloured tables and then periodically, depending on the funding uh, that we've got available, we'll collate and analyse our data by site or by season we've just um, released the past four years of data analysed on the portal, which is very exciting. So here you can see the site reports which, that we've created, which bring together all the site photos, observations and results for each site over the four year period. These are created on Canva. If you haven't explored Canva as yet um, and you're part of a project that's trying to spread your message, I highly recommend you check it out. Something else that we've explored uh, with our data communications is using Google Maps to spatially show our sites of, of like priority and our sites of concern. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd recommend exploring those as well. They're really great to be able to kind of communicate the data in this way to people. So what is our data telling us? Well, basically, once we've analysed our data, it's showing that the rivers of the Bellinger and Pauline catchments are in very good health. It's verifying our scientific understanding that these are unique river systems and some of the healthiest and most pristine rivers in Australia. And there's a responsibility that comes with these excellent river health results. Um, caring for the environment doesn't just look like improving areas of poor health. With, it's important now more than ever that we also focus on protecting our healthy ecosystems such as this one not just for the diverse species that rely on these rivers, but for the generations to come. So I'd like to uh, finish up by thanking our partners who make our program possible. Thanks. Bye. All right, a big thanks to Amy for prepping that as well. And um, one of the best things about that project um, is the bridge that has been created between the citizen scientists, the Water Watch program, and the scientists in our um, water division and the department um, in the New South Wales government. And we've had some fantastic collaboration with them and it's just really, really making this program amazing. It's certainly one to watch on your, on your radar. Um, so the next one, if we could have uh, Izzy from Fresh Water Watch, please. Yeah. Um... And I'd like to introduce uh, Izzy in her presentation because I've worked with Izzy. Uh, she's been a member of our global 
uh, open science and citizen science uh, community of practice. So um, I've learned about the work that Earthwatch are doing um, internationally uh, from that. So uh, this is an, a, an in very interesting project. And I would again say that we've had to separate out um, the presentation because um, we didn't have enough time in this session. But um, the other part of this, which is about the global project itself, uh, is, is, is very much about data sharing. But the other part of the, the project, um, Stephen Lazual is um, giving that tonight in the International Inspiration session at seven o'clock. So again, if you'd like to hear some more detail, then have a go at that. And this is Izzy talking Hi everyone, about data. my name's Izzy. Um, this is the second of two talks today about a global citizen science project, Freshwater Watch. Hopefully you've already heard my... Hi everyone, my name's Izzy. Um, this is the second of two talks today about a global citizen science project, Freshwater Watch. Hopefully you've already heard my colleague Stephen Loisel talk about some of the things our citizen scientists are doing across the world. In this talk, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about our approach to sharing data. Now, Freshwater Watch citizen scientists measure basic freshwater ecosystem health. Um, just to give you a little bit more context about what they're actually doing. It's a very simple method. It was designed as part of a corporate sustainability program. So um, for bankers, it's also been used with children. Um, the volunteers firstly enter some quite qualitative information. So site name, take a photograph. Um, is the water flow still so fast? What's the um, water body type? And then they do some simple physico-chemical tests. So for nitrates and phosphates, which are nutrients um, that in excess cause eutrophication, turbidity, which is how clear or cloudy the water is, and water color. And these tests are designed to replicate the tests that are used in labs by um, government agencies and researchers. So they are directly comparable to lab results. Now, it's very important to us that the data Freshwater Watch is producing is um, robust and reliable. And the reason is that we want Freshwater Watch to be more than just citizen scientists going and collecting data for the sake of it. We want the data to be used in research and in decision making. So we have quite a lot of different ways that we um, either prevent errors being made or pick them up after the event. Things like um, we regularly compare the results being produced by our kits to results in labs. Um, we compare results being collected by citizen scientists to results being collected by professionals. Um, we have quite intense and kind of um, coordinated training. So volunteers all know how to collect the data accurately and we can keep an eye on who understands and who doesn't. Um, and they can revisit that training online at any point. And then we also have kind of manual checks. So a freshwater watch professional checks the data every month. Um, individuals are also encouraged to check their data. So this graph on the right shows um, what a volunteer might see. This volunteer has uploaded a result that's quite different to um, others locally in its group and global averages. So we might encourage them to go and revisit the site just to check. Um, and we also get kind of local group leaders to go and check results as well. All of this is underpinned by a technical infrastructure. So um, we have an app that provides instant feedback so that volunteers can check the context of the data and check that they've not accidentally pressed the wrong thing. And also by the web platform, which allows um, people to compare their data to others. Now, I said that the reason we're so keen on having such robust data is because we like to share it. Um, the, there are several ways we do this. Firstly, the data is licensed under Creative Commons. Um, so anybody can go and download the raw data and also the metadata from the Freshwater Watch website. 
Um, we use the data ourselves to create public facing reports, um, videos, and also scientific papers. And we also share data with um, people who might be interested in using it. So this is typically governments, um, environment agencies, researchers, um, and other kind of people involved in, in environmental management. Some of these just take the raw data and some of them use the data to create online web platforms. So this example is something that was created for us by the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology and is used by the Environment Agency to view their data alongside freshwater watch data. Now, I want to highlight that we do have some challenges with this sharing data. Firstly, we've created the Freshwater Watch web platform ourselves back in 2012. So while we have a self-managed data repository, it doesn't yet have a DOI. Um, that is something that we're working on to bring us into line with fair data sharing principles. We also find that because we're sharing data across sectors, so for example, with governments, um, different industries have different metadata standards and some don't have metadata standards at all. So we quite often spend quite a long time editing or provide, providing new versions of our metadata to suit different contexts. Um, the European Citizen Science Association has created a kind of citizen science metadata framework and we do try to use that, but we also recognise that different sectors have different requirements. Now, that's a lot of work. <laughs> We've got to check the method is kind of producing robust data. We've got to make sure that data is being shared effectively and the metadata is going alongside that. Why? It's because, like I said, we really want the citizen scientists who are involved in Freshwater Watch to be able to make a difference. So we, we're really keen that the data is usable in science and in decision making. This example I've put up is an example from Zambia, where we've got citizen scientists collecting data that is robust enough to be used in scientific research papers, but is also being shared with the Water Resources Management Authority, um, where they're using the data to monitor progress towards SDG 6. This is a really exciting thing for us because we believe people and the involvement of people are really key to the sustainable development goals and citizen science is a mechanism for making that happen. If we want citizen science to really contribute to this, we need to make sure that um, the data are of good enough quality and that they are easily shareable. So that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. If you are interested in learning more, getting involved in Freshwater Watch or um, being on the receiving end of some of our data, we have 30,000 data points now and we're very happy to share, then please get in touch. Yes, there we have it then. Um, if anybody's got any questions for Izzy, can you put them in the chat? Because I know she'd be interested in your comments and ideas, and uh, um, I think it would be uh, it would be great if if you do have anything you want to say to her or ask of her. But uh, she's great to work with, so I I can encourage that. Now, um, the next thing we have is uh, is hey from, everyone, my name. Oops, sorry, is from Janet and Nathan from CSIRO. Um, Janet's uh, work, worked with Janet for a number of years. She's the research team leader of the Aquatic Remote Sensing Team, uh, works all over the world, but she also leads the CSIRO Eye on Water project. And Nathan is uh, an experimental scientist. Um, and he's uh, working with remote sensing, data analytics, machine learning, and scientific data management which is why he's very interesting to us today. Now, um, they prepared a, a video, so we'll, we'll show that, but they are here and they will be available for questions and they'll also be available for our discussions later on. Hello, my name is Janet Anstey from CSIRO and I'm talking with Nathan Drayson about our work on our citizen science project, Iron Water, as well as our bio-optical database both of which are used in the validation of water quality 
plant information. But first I wanted to talk about some of the general principles that we use in the implementation of data management. The FAIR data principles stand for findable, interoperable, accessible and reusable data. These principles are essential when working with information data sets. The Australian National Data Service has a website with great resources for citizen scientists and researchers alike. There's guides, tools and documentation which are all freely available. There's a list of research vocabularies commonly used and there, there is even a service to upload and describe your vocabulary that you use in your application and then convert it to make it more integratable with other data types. The FAIR principles are useful framework when thinking about sharing your data with others as it will increase their discovery and the opportunity for innovation with those data sets. It will maximise their use and reuse and it provides an important um, framework for data integration and harmonisation. It allows you to automate analyses by making the data machine readable so you can harvest additional information from the data. By using the FAIR data principles, it importantly will increase the impact of your data. For our project, the index data repositories were critical. They provided not only a storage uh, repository for our data, but also for the metadata and additionally supply digital object identifiers, which gives us a way to provide data citations for all the information collated. Once the data repos repositories are established, then the data becomes accessible interoperable and reusable for this and future applications. The Research Data Australia site has a portal that allows you to search through other data repositories to view and explore others' data. The FAIR data principles have been used in the Ion Water application and in our work in aquatic remote sensing which will now be demonstrated by Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. So the citizen science data that we incorporate into our research project is um, from the Iron Water app. And the Iron Water app allows a user to take a photo of a water body, and it takes the spectral information from that photo and uh, processes it via the spectral sensitivity of the human eye. So it gives you a colour classification that a person looking at that water body um, would give. And there are 21 different colours that describe, describe almost all the different types of natural water colours uh, that are out there. So when we're out collecting our um, bio-optical data that we do um, as part of uh, wider validation projects, we also make sure that we uh, collect uh, several data points using the Iron Water app. So this allows us to compare what comes from the Iron Water app, um, as well as what we determine from our in-situ optical sensors, as well as some of the physical and chemical properties that we measure in the water bodies, such as the absorption and backscattering. And from all of these different data points, we can calculate a forever index so that we have one from chemical and physical properties, we have one from optical properties, and we also have one from the iron water app as well. So um, a lot of this data, uh, a lot of this bio-optical data um, that's routinely collected has been collected over quite a long period of time um, and usually done by different projects with slightly different purposes um, and therefore different collection protocols. Um, the data has been stored in a range of different formats in different structured repos repositories and that were done by different personnel. Um, so as part of our project, we really wanted to make sure that we could leverage all of this data. Um, and so uh, we've built a relational database that, is, um, that uses a consistent vocabulary, um, which makes all our data uh, traceable so we can get um, any data point we can trace it all the way back to where it was originally measured and how it was measured um, which helps us with interpreting the data 
um, and validating it as well. Um, and it makes the analysis that's done from that data much more repeatable um, and transparent. So I'd just like to give you a bit of an example of how we can do that kind of analysis based on our relational database um, being structured so nicely. So um, one thing we can do is look at the um, different bio-optical properties based on different ferrolial indexes. So here on the left-hand side, we've got chlorophyll concentration. On the right-hand side, uh, we've got uh, phytoplankton absorption. So it's how much light gets absorbed by phytoplankton in the water. Um, and we can see that the relationship there is a bit complicated. Uh, it goes up and down from the blue waters on the left-hand side through the green waters in the middle to the brown waters on the right-hand side. Um, so it's a bit up and down um, and all over the place. If we look at non-algal particulate matter, so this is all the uh, solid stuff that's in the water, that's not algae, um, we can see that there's a much clearer relationship going on there. So our blue waters on the left-hand side um, um, aren't showing much absorption, and the brown waters on the right-hand side there, up at the higher ferrolial indexes, are showing much higher non-algal particulate absorptions. And we get a similar kind of relationship uh, with covered dissolved organic matter as well. So this is all your organics that have um, some sort of spectral absorption properties. And again, as you might expect, the nice blue waters on the left-hand side um, tend to have not much absorption and the um, quite brown turbid waters on the right-hand side tend to have much higher um, sea level absorptions. Um, so that's all the absorbing properties of the water, but obviously we also care about the light that gets scattered back towards an eye or a satellite or a sensor. Um, and so this is uh, this comes through with the particular backscattering in, on this plot. So here we can see that similar to the other ones, um, the blue waters on the left hand side tend not to scatter um, very much water, but the uh, brown turbid waters on the right hand side that have lots of particles in them uh, tend to do a lot more scattering. So um, we've seen some uh, pretty pictures, um, but what can we do with that? So um, what we really want to know is which of these features are most important in determining the colour of the water, so the ferrule index that comes out um, the other end. One way to do that is through a random forest. Now, a random forest is built up of random trees. Um, in this instance, uh, we have decision trees, which are a series of yes or no questions which are used to um, classify a particular set of data, in this case based on the Pharrell Yule Index. Now if you have one decision tree, that's fine, but what you can do is have lots of uh, decision trees and you can change the yes or no questions very slightly and you can see which ones are best at classifying the Pharrell Yule Index based on those parameters. And from doing that, you can then build up how important are uh, each of those parameters in determining the, the Pharrell yield index. So if we do that, um, we get uh, as we come to a similar conclusion that we came to um, by just looking at our data. But we've quantified a little bit, and we can be a bit sure of our relationship. So here we've got. Um, uh, the feature importance graph that comes out of the random forest um, and it tells us a similar thing. So our non-alkyl particulate absorption and our seed elm absorption are quite important, the two most important parameters for determining the ferrule index. And then our particulate backscattering, our phytoplankton absorption and another parameter called gamma, which we don't need to worry about, um, are of lesser importance. Um, and so what this does is it gives us a framework for when we go back and interpret our citizen science data. Um, so this is Lake Burley Griffin down the road from us. Um, and there's quite a lot of uh, data points that have been collected by generous people. Um, and what we can now do is we can, have, when we look at this data, we can say, okay, so all of these brown points here are generally uh, should be associated with higher particulate inflows and higher um, CDOM inflows and some of those more greeny aquary observations are likely to be when, when those conditions were not present. Um, and so it just gives us a framework with which we can then um, relate our bio-optical data through our citizen science app back to um, our water body and the data that um, 
people have collected for us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nathan, Janet. I'm very sorry about the technical issues there. I uh, do apologize about that, but um, it, it's a fascinating um, presentation. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question, um, if I may, uh, which is that how your approach could help with um, different people who have different masses of water quality data that, that we've heard about this afternoon and what data we gather in the future. How could you, the, the approach that you're taking at the moment make a, make a difference? Um, and I don't mind which of you replies to that one. <laughs> I'll take that one, okay. <laughs> G'day everybody. I hope I'm a bit clearer now than what I was before. Um, Really, what we what I what I was doing in that presentation was was using our citizen science data to prove something that we already know, um, as 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 a validation technique. So um, it, it it's pretty obvious that brown water is dirtier than clear water, um, but but what that but what the the demonstration that I did was to um, find a way of quantifying that and find a way of uh, scaling the extent to which different parameters are important based on different classes um, of water body that uh, that were identified by the app. So um, even though it is something that is pretty obvious and, and already known, it's it's a it's a nice way of uh, validating your data and, and therefore um, once you can say those things about it, then it's a, a platform to, to start moving off and, and, and start being able to use that for other purposes as well. Oh, and here's Janet. I might come in too. I'll stay my 1.5 um, away. Um, yeah, I think it's about discoverability and, and data analytics. Once you bring your data in together into a usable form, which we've done through our relational database with uh, vocabulary that where we've harmonised data that was collected from previous um, you know, campaigns and field trips and um, a different time when perhaps data was collected under different protocols. We've harmonised that data together. And what that's enabled us to do is, is actually do some data analytics on it, which is what Nathan showed with the random forest. You can look at relationships that perhaps weren't discoverable without that um, relational database being constructed. And so I think this is the point that Izzy in the previous um, presentation was all also bringing together, that it means that the data is then um, being able to be analysed and um, used um, for not only your current project, but into the future. And so you're setting up that framework for, for both of those, um, both the analytics and uh, the usability. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's great, and I think that's really important for this group, this meeting. So uh, we really appreciate that, and we will make your video available so that people can play it themselves. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so um, where am I? Let me go see where we are next. Right. Um, so we're already running a little bit behind time, so um, about fifteen minutes, but. Um, what we might do is just crack into the breakout sessions and we'll come back for some feedback and uh, we'll see how we're going in terms of the rest of it. So um, we're going to be pretty short on time, everyone. So make sure you put in your bits and pieces. Uh, but if you don't get to add all that you want, please let us know and we can add it in later. Thank you. We have um, breakout rooms made for us, do we, Janine? Yeah. I'm happy to open those um, breakout rooms now. And would you still like it to go for 15 minutes or would you like to reduce the time to save a bit? Catch up. How does everybody know? That's no good. Um, let's, uh, let's make it 10 minutes and then we'll yeah. come back and I'll put the slide up of um, the questions. They are up in the chat somewhere, so um, you should see them. Thank so you very much. So if you could join whichever chat room you, whichever breakout room you'd like to go to, then that would be great. So we have uh, breakout room one is to do with data. 
Um, two is, oh, sorry. There's one is what's happening and where. Two is data. And then three is best practice standards and QAQC. So if everyone wants to click in now, we'll see you in there. Okay, breakout rooms have closed. Right. Welcome back everyone. Welcome, welcome back everyone. And thank you for trying that. And, um, I can see the Miro boards and see some of the actions, but uh, uh, I wonder if we can um, just have a bit of feedback from people, please. I'll put the, um, the questions up. Um, maybe somebody from each room would like to would like to have a, a feedback of, of the beginnings of a discussion. I know we didn't get very far, um, but if you'd like to sit, uh, someone would like to talk about what, uh, what you talked about. Could we have someone from the data group to feedback what, what we got there, if we had any interesting conversations already? I can do it if you like. Thanks, Nathan. It's all right. We we didn't get too far. It, um, even though I was the owner of those mirror boards, it wouldn't let me put anything on them. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. But anyway, um, uh, we we had a, a, we mostly just reflected on the presentations that we saw because yeah. there was a lot of useful, interesting things in there. Um, on the first point. Um, one of the things we had a really quick chat about um, in terms of the users, and we were talking about it in relation to how how the data is stored as well. I, I, I was really impressed by a lot of the presentations, making sure that they um, had different levels of data availability for different users. So, um, you know, if, if someone wants to have the raw numbers, they can, but then there's really nice summaries that gives a lot of different people different entry points, which I thought was a really good point. You know, I generally work as a scientist and, um, and a data analyst, and so I'm usually only coming at these things from wanting to grab the numbers. Um, so I think it's actually really interesting that other people use this data as well of what are your different entry points and, and how does the way you store and, and analyze your data reflect who you want to talk to. So I think that was something that I hadn't thought of enough. Um, and um, we also talked about uh, decentralized databases, so um, which allow a lot of flexibility. So um, having having one big uh, repository with a lot of flexibility has its benefits because it can be used for a lot of different purposes. Um, and but we also talked about how. Um, that can make your entry point quite high. So a, a very big, very flexible database that can handle a lot of different data and machine readable data and all these sorts of things um, can be quite hard to for an average person to use. And so I suppose that's a, a difficulty in the entry point. But that's really all we've got to. OK, but that's that's a really good start. And the idea of a decentralized database is that's what we probably have at the moment is is quite a lot of decentralized databases and what would be really good is a way of, of actually integrating the data um, to analyze it better and I thought that in a way somehow um, a relational database in the way that you were talking might allow that or people need to have the same metadata so that they can um, they can compare across databases is that right uh, yeah so I, I, I suppose I should clarify what I meant by that um, so uh, a lot of databases are generally organized around uh, tables um, but you don't have to do it that way um, you can um, you can structure your databases in much more flexible ways than that. And so what I meant by decentralized would be um, a data repository that could take data from a lot of different sources and it doesn't necessarily need to be um, integrated as a whole to do that. So um, particularly if you're thinking about uh, local needs for uh, local areas, like most many of the presentations that we, that we heard were for um, 
very specific locations and that's where the data is most relevant to. So um, thinking about decentralization more in terms of allowing it to be adapted to, to local needs, I suppose is what I meant by that. Yeah. So that's covered one or two. Anybody mm. else got any comments in there? I guess the only, sorry, Peter, the, the reason that um, Waterwatch, um, New South Wales and ACT developed theirs on the ALA was um, purely because of barriers, because of cost and, and what services were available out there and having to design your own database, which had an extraordinary cost to it, as I'm sure everybody knows. So that's why we ended up working with the ALA team to develop something specific, but that could be used by a wide group of water watchers um, to add their data. So it could be um, generic enough to suit everybody, but not specific enough to sort of some, some people would need to add additional fields in, um, and results in comments. So that was probably, um, I guess, a barrier for all of that sort of stuff. Peter, was there something you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of add to what Nathan said and, and also uh, the, the previous comment. Um, uh, the, the extent to which, um, you know, you, you have federation or aggregation um, sort of services in some respects depends on what you want to do with the data and, and that can dictate, you know, sort of what level of, of standardization you need so uh, for example if if you just wanted disparate data sets to be discoverable then standardization around the metadata is what's really important so that so that, you, know, you can use a, a common language for for actually navigating the um the things that you're interested in in the data sets uh, but if you actually want to join different data sets together um, standardization at the attribute level within databases is important. Yeah. So um, it doesn't necessarily, uh, so picking up where Nathan said, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, everything has to be the same. Yeah. Um, so as Ingrid indicated, uh, the, the platform that we're providing to New South Wales Water Watch versus, uh, um, as well as ACT Water Watch are actually, it's the same platform um, most of it is the same, but there's there's differences between the the uh, form templates provided to New South Wales versus um, ACT because they're collecting slightly different uh, things in some instances, but a lot of common stuff as well. So we're actually able to join together on the common things and still allow flexibility for local context. So I think a lot of it needs uh, to be determined by the, the people you want to use it. Um, and again, conversations with them might be useful. Uh, can we go on to one of the other um, questions? Um, Ingrid, would you like to take one of those? Yeah, um, just, I'm just sticking the feedback form in the chat. So if everyone wants to click on that, but we'll put it in a follow-up email as well. I'm just trying to not to make the spelling mistakes. <laughs> um, so in our group, uh, we ran out of time, of course, because we're I'm a chatter and um, we were hearing lots of cool stories about people in the room but mostly it was around listing some of those um, water watch so like water watch New South Wales, water watch Victoria, some of the other projects finding about what other people were doing um, that some everybody sort of got their own database storages or excel spreadsheets or how they might have security and privacy issues around how their data is stored and managed um, and we didn't quite get to the central repository part, but I guess um, what um, my first thought is, is that it would have to be, and I guess that's kind of leading into that best practice QAQC, is that everybody needs to collect the same base data so that we can have comparability across the country. Um, whether that's all different equipment, all that sort of stuff, I guess all that needs to be agreed, but that's probably the next group's chat. But um, I guess the central repository needs to mirror what we're looking at in those standards as well. Mm -hmm. And how about linking best practice standards? Uh, Wu, did you, were you leading that group? That's Sylvia. Was Sylvia, was it? Sorry. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> nice pass. <laughs> okay. Yes, we just had a very quick 
uh, start of a conversation about this. I think there's an awful lot of things we could have covered here, but there was the way it started was um, if people are using different equipment, which does happen across even within a, a state program, uh, and the and the equipment measures different units. How do you get people to try and enter the right units when they're enter, entering the data? They might be using the equipment right, but then there's issues when they don't then go to enter it. Um, and issues with calibration. And if it's done right, do you need to record that information about the calibration with the data as well? So that that might increase the trust level for the data if if that happens. Um, and that was sort of as far as the conversation got. <laughs> okay, but I think we've made a really good uh, sort of start here. And as far as I'm concerned, I've been blown away by how, how far people have progressed since, since we talked about it three years ago. Um, I'm amazed that, that these, everybody working hard with very little funding um, because it matters, have developed their ideas and their way they present things. Um, and I'm just hoping that there's interest in people getting together. It would be much better if we could have a whole day workshop somewhere, somehow, to talk about this. We can't really do it in an hour and a half with only half an hour um, for, for questions. So um, can I just say thank you to everybody that's contributed. What we will do is to write up um, from the recording, we'll try and collect the comments and things together as much as we can. And we'll put something together and share it for your future ideas. You can still use the Miro board. So please, uh, if Nathan unlocks it for everybody, then, then add your comments in there and we'll pull it all together. But do fill in the feedback form because the, one of the questions there is, would you like to form some kind of a loose group or community of practice to try and work collaboratively to, to try and move this forward because so much has happened and so it's so important just at this po point in time. I think it would be a really good idea to, to try and collect this energy together and, and to do something with it, to present it for people because the value of the work that's being done out there is evident from everything we've heard this afternoon. So Ingrid, would you like to say anything to, to round up? Um, oh, no, just that, yeah, again, thank you everybody for being involved in today's chat. I know we didn't kind of get the chance for everyone to talk, but um, even just gathering this community together, um, you know, it has been a, a, a mega step. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, we've just um, continuing, I guess, you know, funding changes, governmental changes, elections and all that sort of thing. As I said, we just keep riding the wave and by pure pa passion and interest in our roles or in the programs we're working on, we just want to keep pursuing this. So if we can um, continue these discussions um, and look at how we can collaborate better on a national level, because uh, I like as the Water Bug Blitz program demonstrated that, you know, there is no national water quality health program particularly. So we need to kind of look at that and make that happen. And I guess, um, you know, get the community involved and look at accountability and stuff like that. So the more we can pursue citizen science um, on this platform would be wonderful and it's great to have you all involved. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And thank you very much for our technical staff, um, Lisa, Janine, Michelle. Um, thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> thanks, presenters, and thanks to everybody for your time. Okay.